yeah, as we mentioned, you guys have talked about Don't Eat the Pictures a little bit on your show. So yes. what is your relationship specifically? So on our show, one of the many sub-series we do is called Things We Kind of Remember, where we discuss things that we're kind of nostalgic for but haven't really revisited. And we did a couple of episodes on Sesame Street stuff that was in the periphery of our memory. Yes. That's right. And I was completely unfamiliar with this specific special, but Allie had a lot of memories of it. Yeah, this is one, yes. of, one of the five videotapes that we had at our house that would get like played on constant. I think the other was like, Little Mermaid, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Pulp Fiction, and I think some sort of failure. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> My favorite scene in Don't Eat the Pictures is when they accidentally shoot the guy in the back. <laughs> One! One time that Marvin was shot in the face. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Say what again! Say what again? Me dare you! Me double dare you! <laughs> yeah, as you can tell, one of those tapes was left by my uncle one of the times he came to stay over. So. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> 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 but yeah, listening back to the episode yesterday, Allie, I'm surprised how much of this you remember because a lot of what you predicted was spot on. I, yes. Yeah, no, it's one of those very few things like hooked into my brain the way that that special did. And every so often I'm like, I should revisit it like prior to that. And I'm like, no, no. It's like, I'm worried. I was worried about like, you know, going back and like, oh, really? This is what I've like made two thirds of my personality on. Is this this fucking like special? <laughs> and then I'm like, no. And then I like, rush. I'm like, yeah, no, I remember way, way more of this than I thought I did. And it was like scary how much of it was just sort of like on par with it. Welcome back to At Home with the Dogginses. Hi, everyone. And welcome back to Things We Kind of Remember. Indeed so. <laughs> now, I've been on a Sesame Street kick lately for complicated reasons. <laughs> as of I as well. Uh, part of it was, uh, this is several months ago now, but for Christmas, Allie got me a uh, Grover monster at the end of this book. You turn the page! <laughs> T-shirt, which I love dearly. And with it came a, a hardback copy of the monster at the end of this book. Which the reason I bought that is that uh, a couple of years ago, we went to go see the traveling uh, Sesame uh, uh, Muppet exhibit that ha uh, came to L.A. Yes, we vlogged about that many moons ago. Yeah, and there is a uh, portion of the exhibit that is dedicated to uh, original merch from uh, mm -hmm. Sesame Street. And one of the first ones was the monster at the end of this book. Was uh... And honestly, monster at the end of this book, like might be a future obsession of the moment because like I love it as you know baby's first duck amok you yeah, know baby's yeah. first meta and we watched uh, a while ago on HBO Max we watched the new animated special the monster at the end of the story which was okay it was, fine. It was okay but it didn't it didn't have what makes the book work and I knew it wouldn't because what makes the book work would only work in book form. Yeah. Anyway, with the Sesame Street kick I've been on lately, I thought back to Sesame Street stuff that I haven't revisited. <laughs> Sesame mm. Street stuff. And mostly I wanted to talk about the non-Muppet Sesame Street segments because those do not come up in YouTube recommendations yeah. the same way. Yeah. Like those kind of get swept aside. But uh, first we'll, we can talk about... Uh, more familiar Muppet-related Sesame Street things that we remember from childhood but haven't stumbled across yet in our revisitations. Yeah, uh, there's a, a key one that I do want to get back to at some point because uh, I think this film sort of inspired me down the career path that I've kind of been on. As we may have mentioned, I've worked in museums and arts organizations and uh I think the thing that inspired it more than anything else was this uh, Sesame Street property called Don't Eat the Pictures that came out like in the late 80s, I think, or something like that. I mean, Don't Eat the Pictures is always good advice. Yeah, but it's... Um, what, was this like a feature film or was it like a home video? It or? was a home video, mm. but it was like about, I think it was like about 58 minutes long. So it was like, you know, I, I think it was just a bit too short to, to release in theaters, but it was like sure. a home video. And the reason I think it had to be a home video is because they shot on location at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is not exactly a cheap place to shoot. Sure. There's kind of classic, you, gotta, you have the characters sort of wandering around late at night, sort of seeing 
the uh, the museum and checking out the pictures. And everyone ev- pretty often has to tell Cookie Monster, don't eat the pictures, because <laughs> obvious reasons. Uh, but at one point, a cat comes out of nowhere, and the cat sort of hangs out with them. And Is it a... Played by a real cat, or is it played a, by a Muppet cat? a real cat. cat. Okay, an, an actual cat. And then the ghost of a small Egyptian child shows up out of nowhere. <laughs> well, that took a turn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this small Egyptian child has been stuck in the halls of the Met for basically millennia. And he needs to go up to whatever the Egyptian version of heaven is, basically. <laughs> but he needs help to find his way. <laughs> And the cat is supposed to help him guide it to there, but also he needs the help of the Sesame Street Muppets that are there to help him get to the great beyond. So he needs to gather a feather, and if it weighs against the heart at a right angle, he'll be able to ascend and leave the museum finally. This is a real thing (laughs) from this. Just... This is wild. It's wild. And it's like, it's in the middle of this whole thing where they're talking about art and like the Met and museums and Cookie Monster. Don't eat the pictures. And then suddenly this whole weird subplot where Big Bird is like honor bound to help this ghost of a small Egyptian child who's wearing like the, like he has the little Amun Ra hat on and like the thing and the heavy eyeliner too. So it's like Egypt child. (laughs) Probably played by someone who was not actually Egyptian? I'm assuming probably a Latino kid, to be fair. Mm. <laughs> like, I mean, Sesame Street was always progressive for its time, but just given the time this was made, even progressive for its time could still be pretty regressive. It's, it's like, this is sort of why every so often I I will remember, oh yeah, don't eat the pictures. There was like a great, like a music number where the pictures are yelling at Cookie Monster to not eat them. And then like, I remember that subplot and I'm like, I want to revisit this movie, but I kind of don't want to at the same time. <laughs> Cause I just feel like the cringe I will have watching this entire like, Big Bird has to help this kid ascend to heaven and figure out how to do it best. <laughs> Did they do cutaways to other segments like a real Sesame Street episode or was it all? I feel like they did. It was all in the content finds of the museum itself. Like they would have everybody sort of like would kind of go off into little different little groups. Mm-hmm. Like I think Grover was sort of in kind of the medieval wing. And I think he because, you know, he's just sort of in his super Grover format. Mm-hmm. Um, so he wants to look at his friends that also have the same hats as he does, basically, because he's kind of has a knight's hat for his super Grover. And like Bert, Bert and Ernie are obviously there because, you know, of course, stars have to be there. Yeah, because they're the big names. Exactly. Because the reason I ask is one of the Sesame Street segments I have not re-stumbled across on YouTube, but I do kind of remember, was this bit where uh, Luis and Maria were in this museum and they're Mm -hmm. looking at the art and they keep saying, like, I think this art is stupendous. Well, I think it's magnificent. Well, Mm -hmm. I think... and But then... uh, in the painting, I think it's Gordon and Susan, like their face through the holes, like being the face of the, and they come to life and it, it turns into a song about synonyms. Like, no, you're, you're both agreeing. You're using different words. Mm -hmm. A song about synonyms. That was a pastiche of you say potato. Nice. So it was like, you say stupendous while I say wonderful or whatever. But I don't remember if any Muppets showed up in this segment, but I have a vague image of like maybe Telly was the Mona Lisa or something. That sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. But the image I really remember that I just remember being like not fully terrified of because there were some Sesame Street segments that actually scared me. Yeah. But just a little creeped out by was like there was a statue of Atlas who was Bob all in like yes. white. Yes. Okay, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. White uh, powder and just looking just a little off-putting. Just, yeah. And anyway, that that's the segment I picture when I think of Sesame Street going to a museum. Yeah, no, I, I don't believe that was a part of this film specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised if they also, like, well, if we're here, let's just shift yeah. here. Yeah, um, although, although in my memory, that museum was probably pretty plainly a set. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. This was a film that was, like, just kind of in our collection of, like, DVD, like, not DVDs, because it was the 90s who had DVDs then, mm-hmm. uh, of VHSs that we just sort of cycled through along with, like, Harriet the Spy and, like, mm-hmm. all of the Disney classics and things like that. But that one was, like, one that held a real deep fascination for me for, um, you know how I'm thinking one of your videos, you said you were, like, into Barney just a smidge too long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was into that movie 
I think up until the time I turned like 15. So like I was maybe a little too old for it by that point. You know? But it's also funny how both of our uh, careers were uh, launched by fascination from PBS properties because I've mentioned before I wanted to be a filmmaker because of Mr. Rogers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you went to museums because of Sesame Street. Yeah. We had a few Sesame Street videos in our collection that got a lot of rotation. Uh, the one that was probably in the same line, like, I'm guessing they did a whole line of Sesame Street home video visits mm -hmm. these locations. Because the one we had was Sesame Street home video visits the firehouse. Yeah, yeah. That was the full title. I distinctly remember it opening with Big Bird saying the full words, Sesame Street home video visits the firehouse. <laughs> It starts just a normal day on the street and Big Bird and Elmo and some human kids are playing mm -hmm. and they're playing with a toy fire truck, but then they see smoke coming out of Oscar's trash can. <laughs> so they're like, we need to get a grown up. Gordon, Gordon, there's like, there's smoke, there's a fire. And they call Gordon and uh, Gordon's like, you stay here, I'll call the fire department. And Big Bird's like, no, we can call the fire department. Fire department, fire department. And Gordon's <laughs> like, I meant on the telephone. <laughs> But then the fire department shows up. Of course, it's not actually a fire. Oscar's just having a grouch barbecue. Of course. Just smoking out. So they go back with the firefighters to the firehouse. And again, another just bit I distinctly remember uh, is Gordon being like, there it is, Sesame Street Engine Company. And Big Bird's like, Engine Company? I thought we were going to the firehouse. <laughs> so then they get the tour of the firehouse. And there's this whole song that's been stuck in my head many times. Mm -hmm about uh, the things the firefighters do while they're killing time waiting for the alarm. There's this whole waiting for the bell to ring, waiting to drop everything. And uh, it, it starts like just the, the chief is watching two of the firefighters playing table tennis. It's like, we ping, we pong, we pong, we ping, while waiting for the bell to ring. And... That song has gotten stuck in my head many a times, despite me not having watched this video since my age was double digits. Mm -hmm. But I watched it so much as a child that these things just stick with you. Oh, of course. Um, other videos we had, we had a couple in a series that was called Sesame Songs. I feel like we had a few of those, too. And, and it was basically collections of songs from the show, but with new framing devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know one of them was called Monster Hits, and I think that was the one where there was, like, a, a DJ who was a wolf Muppet and, like, other characters were, were calling in to play requests mm -hmm. or, or to ask for requests, and then the requests would be existing Sesame Street songs. And thinking back, I'm pretty sure the wolf puppet was probably a Wolfman Jack parody. Yeah, that makes sense. But I would not have gotten that at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were others that were just like general Sesame Street videos. I remember one called Play Along Games and Songs. Mm -hmm. That one, I believe we did have, yeah. I don't remember anything about it other than the beginning where uh, like Big Bird is gathering everyone like, hey, want to play games? And Forgetful <laughs> Jones is like, no, I, I don't like playing games. That's why they call me No Game Just Jones. And I was <laughs> like, no, you're forgetful. Jones, you love games. Like, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I feel like um we got that for some reason. We had like a bunch of tapes given to us. That one and I believe it was Barbie Fitness was also given to us around the same time. <laughs> and like I think just sort of frequently what my what uh my Bob was like, okay, you're gonna watch Barbie Fitness and you're gonna do all the exercise. And once that's done, we're gonna put on the game thing for you as your cool down. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. It's like a way to... It's a good regiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just think I do remember... I, I, I may want to do a separate things we kind of remember about Barbie Fitness because the... Please. The yeah. most terrifying thing about that is that there is a there is a CGI Barbie that is like leading the workshop and it's just a bit too uncanny valley. You know, I feel like I saw parts of this at a friend's house once. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel like... Uh, I was visiting a friend and their sister was watching the Barbie fitness. And was it like CGI Barbie in front of like real human exercisers? Yeah, including, exercisers? including yeah. a small, tiny uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, who is one of the the tiny children that was exercising with her in this video. Oh, wild. Yeah. Cause, and she's credited for it as, as Jenny Love in this. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've seen this. Like that image 
it was deep in the recesses of my brain. I, I, I feel like, God, I, not that I ever want to invoke this person's name, but like, I do feel like at one point, Doug May, uh, Walker had, you know, put that in one of his like clip show uh, videos that he would do occasionally. Possibly. Yeah. I'm sure someone's covered it. Yeah. The only other Sesame Street video I specifically remember owning was uh, one that was called uh, Start to Read with Big Bird. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, existing Sesame Street storybooks. Like, it was three storybooks. Like, it, it wasn't even animated. It was just the drawings from the book, sort of like PowerPoint yeah. style or like Ken Burns style, like sliding through the image while the text was at the bottom of the screen, but you also heard them talking. So it was basically, alert. It was it was like a Disney sing along video, but it was like a read along mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, it it was like one of those Disney read along tapes actually with the book and the tape, but just mm -hmm. in video form. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the stories were um, uh, the city worm and the country worm, which was a you know city mouse mm -hmm. and country mouse, but with uh, but with Oscar's pet worm. Yeah. And then there was a. Uh, uh, there was The Great Cookie Thief, which was another of the classic books we owned in book form. Mm -hmm. You know, an another of those just Sesame Street classic books in my mind up there with Monster at the end of this book. Of course. Uh, and then there was one, I don't remember what the story was called, but it was one where uh, Bert spilled milk and needs a mop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Ernie's like, I'll go find you a mop. And Ernie talks to Big Bird and is like... Basically, this game of telephone is played where uh, Ernie's like, Bert needs a mop. And the next character's like, oh, Bert needs a mat. Oh, Bert needs a mitt. Oh, Bert needs a mitten. It, it sounds like those Twitter games now, which is sort of like... I yeah. Think <laughs> yeah. About, yeah, yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> and it ends with... It, it, it eventually gets to Harry being like, like, oh, Bert needs a kitten. So... <laughs> So everybody shows up with the things and Bert's like, all I needed was a mop. What's going on? <laughs> and finally, Ernie comes with a mop and Bert's like, oh, you're too late because the kitten ate up all the milk that was spilled. Uh, there we go. So those are the Sesame Street videos we owned. One we did not own was the actual Sesame Street feature film, Follow That Bird. Yeah, yeah. We, that was a, a consistent rental at the good old Blockbuster video, that one, but... Uh... We never owned it. <laughs> I only saw it once as a child um, at a friend's house, and I saw it after reading one of the storybook adaptations of scenes from the film. Uh, the storybook was Big Bird Visits the Dodos, mm -hmm. uh, just about the part where he's placed with the Dodo family. Yeah. And so watching the movie, I was like, oh, we're watching Big Bird Visits the Dodos. And the other kids I was with was like, no, the movie's called Follow That Bird. Yeah. And... We were arguing over the title. <laughs> Semantics. <laughs> um, we should revisit Follow That Bird. It's probably on HBO Max. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I I was I wouldn't be shocked if a lot of these were on HBO Max at this point. Yeah. I don't know. Like probably the videos are uh, probably someone's uploaded all the VHSs in their entirety to YouTube. Oh, I fully believe that. Yep. They just haven't come across my recommendations yet. But I I do recall with Follow That Bird is that. Um, I had a hard time with that movie because it was just a hard watch for me for for reasons I can't fully mm. remember why. Um, but it was like every time though, like I would always get to the part where uh, Big Bird is in the cage and singing Blue Bird of Happiness, yeah. and I would just have a complete and utter just like soul crushing meltdown with that portion every time that's valid and my mom would be like are you sure you want to rent this this that you had that thing the last time you guys like i'll be fine this time ah! just on the floor just like you know yeah so I, don't, I don't know if i've ever actually finished follow that bird but yeah i mean that scene was designed for meltdowns yeah it, it's kind of like how um recently uh i i my in a similar vein, my mom once rented The Elephant Man for me to watch. Oh with wow! Her, and I could not get through the first ten minutes of it because it was like scared me so much. And I think recently I saw it was on Criterion and decided to just sit down. I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna watch this movie. And then like I got to the point where I freaked out. I'm like, okay, I think it's good from here. And then it just became so boring to watch. <laughs> 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 There are all those <laughs> movies, and this is something uh, 
Mike Carlson has talked a lot about on Podcast The Ride. It's like, there are all these movies as a kid where just the idea of the movie scares you. Oh, yeah. And, and it just, you're so scared of thinking about what that movie could even have mm-hmm. in it. And then you finally watch it as an adult and it's just nothing. <laughs> it was like, I was surprised how much brain space the Elephant Man sort of took up for me. And then, like, almost the second I, like, got, like, halfway through it, I was like, okay, this is boring. Like, it just disappeared suddenly. Like, all the trauma that I was associated with it was just gone. Just away. I just remember another Sesame Street video we had. I don't remember what this one was called, but I think it was another one in the song series. Because the premise of this video was uh, everyone, like, they brought the piano out on the roof. Mm-hmm. And we're just like doing a sing along out on the roof. I don't remember why. I vaguely why. remember this too. I just don't remember. Why. I, 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 I just remember like uh, the construction Muppets, who I think were named Biff and Sully, were like trying to fix the TV antenna. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, there was like all the humans and kids uh, brought the piano out on the roof, and they were doing sing along of various Sesame Street songs. And at various points, they'd cut to pre-recorded Sesame Street songs, Mm -hmm. sometimes with the framing device about, uh, like, hearing from downstairs yelling up, like, uh, Ernie yelling up, like, hey, I got a song to sing. It's like, well, come on up. It's like, I can't. I'm in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. Okay, then sing down there. And then just cuts to the pre-existing rubber ducky, you're You're the the one. one. Uh, And I remember it all ended with the la-dee-da-dee-da, la-dee-da-dee-da, what's the name of that song? I don't remember what that video was called. I just remember Mm -hmm. having it. And again, everyone listening, if you also remember these things, you can tell us about them. But do not look these things up to tell us about them. Exactly. Do not do 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 research to correct us on this stuff because Mm -hmm. we will do our own research when we want to actually know and not just have these things in the periphery of our memory. You know, another one that we had, but it was like by the time it, it sort of circulated into our house, I was a little too old at that point for it was my brother got, I believe it was like Elmo and Grouchland or something like that. When Yeah, that was after my time. That was after but... my time too. But like, you know, he was of that, he was in that right sweet spot for it. But it was like, I'm not, I'm a grown up. I'm too much of a grown up for this film. Um, but that was got played a lot. And I always just remember like, because I was not a Pokemon person in my house. Mm-hmm. Like everyone but me was a Pokemon person except for me. But like, so whenever I would hear like the theme song for either Pokemon or Elo and Grouch, I'd be like, bye. <laughs> I'm going to go off into my room and listen to Big Spiderback. <laughs> I uh, I saw a clip that I think was from Elmo and Grouchland that that was Ernie and Bert like sort of interrupting the movie when it's at its low point. And Ernie's like, that can't be the end. Movies don't have sad endings. And Bert's like, Titanic had a sad ending. <laughs> And then Bert's just, like, listing all these movies with sad endings. And I think it's, like, Dr. Zhivago had a sad ending. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a solid joke for an Elmo-era Sesame Street yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One thing I know about the movie Follow That Bird, uh, d- again, despite not having watched it since I was a child, uh, like, when it was made, it was before Elmo was Elmo. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, it was before... I think it was when Richard Hunt was still doing Elmo and Mm -hmm. he was a nothing character. Mm -hmm. So like Elmo was in like one crowd shot in the movie. But then when the DVD came out, it was in, you know, current era Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. So Elmo was like all over the DVD menus and the cover and everything. Like they sell the hell out of this movie with Elmo, who has no speaking part in this movie. Mm -hmm. They somehow spliced in like that footage of the uh, of Baby Elmo on the little, the, the potty just going, you know, like that's become like the gif of du jour. <laughs> that was a visual joke for everybody. I'm I'm glad you appreciated that. Uh- <laughs> See, that's the other thing is like, so this started with me wanting to talk about segments. The thing is like Sesame Street now isn't structured the same way, so they don't even do like segments the same way it used to be see she back in my day <laughs> yes grandpa sesame street was an hour-long show and there was like a an ongoing story but then there were like basically commercial breaks except it was just like sketches in the breaks yeah, yeah. and you know educational sketches but some of them would be and and uh th- this was something i learned from uh from the defunct land series on jim henson is like the original idea was that like the ongoing story segments wouldn't have any Muppets in them. That makes sense to me. And the Muppets would only be for the little segments. And 
you know, Jim Henson liked this arrangement because he's like, great, we can produce all the Ernie and Bert stuff and all the Grover stuff. We can do that all on our own pace. We'll have it for you when it's ready. We don't have to follow your shooting schedule. Mm -hmm. But then when the pilot was tested, kids were zoning out during the street segments and they were bored anytime there wasn't a Muppet on screen. So they were like, okay, fine. We need a Muppet. We need some Muppet characters for the street. But Jim's like, I still don't want to work on your schedule. So uh, let's hire somebody to do street exclusive Muppets. Hey, let's get this young Carol Spinney guy to play yeah. Big Bird and Oscar. And, like, they mention Bert and Ernie as living on Sesame Street, but you wouldn't see them in the street segments yeah, at yeah. that time. Nowadays, like, I am so fascinated by the scheduling of a Muppet performer, especially one who's both working Disney Muppets and Sesame Street, yeah. like a Matt Vogel or an Eric Jacobson. Like, I'm so fascinated by, like, they, they got to be bi-coastal and do all this stuff all the time and be ready mm -hmm. at a moment's notice. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Below the Frame, Matt Vogel's podcast, which is which is really good. Um, I'm just fascinated by how many things a Muppeteer has to juggle. You know, I just was thinking about this now. It's like in the era of COVID, how are, like, the multiple person Muppets are doing those right now? Like, Yeah, yeah. It, it's, I don't know. And, and gr granted, now... Like, maybe they're just in a production bubble. But, mm -hmm. like, early on when they were doing Muppet stuff from home, when when there was that whole thing where Elmo's dad was talking to him about, about the civil unrest, which was weird that Elmo's dad was talking to Elmo over Zoom. Yeah. But, but, like, they were sending all the puppets home with the puppeteers, and they did some Muppet stuff, like, with everyone, with all the Muppets being sent home to their respective Muppeteers. But... Yeah, like any Muppet that requires a, a right hand assist, yeah, that, that'd be hard to do in the era of COVID. Um, this would be the time where it's like if any of the Muppeteers have kids, I'm like, uh, all right, uh, 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 Rachel, uh, d uh, Mike, Nikki, uh, <laughs> I, I need you guys to kind of help me with this right now. Daddy's working. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no nowadays Sesame Street, uh, I haven't actually watched a full episode recently, but my understanding is that Basically, at a certain point, they started doing, uh, you, you know, they were still doing, like, for the first 45 minutes of the hour block, they were doing it old style. But then the last 15 minutes would be Elmo's World. Yeah, yeah. And then I think at a certain point, like, and they were talking about how, you know, they did research on the changing attention span of children or, mm -hmm. or how to best uh, do a healthy attention span for children. And now my understanding of Sesame Street is basically four 15-minute segments. Yeah. It, it's not a long story interrupted by other segments. It's just four 15-minute segments. And it'll be like an Elmo's World or a uh, 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 Crumby Pictures, which are the uh, Cookie Monster movie parodies, which I've mm -hmm. seen some of on YouTube. And they're, they're very they're, they're good. They're very good. Yeah. Um, I think part of the reason the non-Muppet segments haven't been as readily preserved is that they are uh just not part of the show's dna anymore yeah i remember like a while ago i think shout factory released like the first season of sesame street on dvd or something like that mm. and i remember it had a content warning on it because of just sort of like you know uh because of some of the way that they shot the older segments and a friend of mine who has children picked up that mm -hmm. season to watch with her kids and just sort of said, it was such a wild experience to watch old school Muppets with her kids, like mm -hmm. knowing that they like kind of watch it at night. I think when she did this, it was like the Elmo's World era and just how weird the pacing was for mm -hmm. the older ones. Because it's like, it is designed very much more slower, that first one, even though it has those cut interstitials. And she's sort of like, it, it, it kind of amazes her that it has sort of snapped around in the way that it has over the past like 60 years at this point. <laughs> Good Lord. I think a lot of people don't realize that, like, like I think a lot of people think of the Muppet Show as being the origin of the Muppet, but like Sesame Street predates the Muppet Show. Yeah. Like the Muppets were known for Sesame Street when the Muppet Show started. Yeah. So the fact that the Muppet Show was aiming at an older audience, like, and the Muppet Show was all like that was after the uh, the the SNL, the the uh, yeah. the Land of Gorch 
sketches that everybody hated. Yeah, yeah. People think of the Muppets as being the Muppet Show Muppets, but like the Muppet Show Muppets have monopolized the name Muppets. Mm -hmm. Like when people think of the brand, the Muppets, they're thinking the cast of the Muppet Show and the Muppet movie. Yeah. But like that was just some Muppets. There is a whole ecosystem of untapped Muppet potential. <laughs> I'm waiting for a Muppet uh, uh, Nick Fury to pop out, just be like, I'm here to talk to you about the Hanson Initiative. <laughs> like, <laughs> there have been so many uh, Muppet Avengers like fan art mashups. Mm -hmm. And what's wild is like Disney used to do these, um, they used to do these Star Wars mashup toys before they owned Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. Like they did uh, Mickey and Friends Star Wars mashup toys. Yeah. Where it was like uh, Mickey and Minnie as Luke and Leia and Goofy as Darth Vader mm -hmm. because got to make Vader not scary for the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they also did these Muppet mashup Star Wars toys where it was Kermit and Piggy as Luke and Leia, Rizzo as Yoda, which I didn't get, but I guess, sure. sure. Um, uh, Pepe I think, would make more sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think Beaker and Bunsen were 3PO and R2, which, yeah. which I like a lot. And, um, uh, Gonzo was Vader because again, <laughs> comedy character playing the villain to take yep. the edge off. But then when Disney bought Lucasfilm, they were like, okay, I think they were trying to distance themselves from the idea of quote Disney Star Wars because they knew nerds mm -hmm. were worried about quote Disneyfying Star Wars. Yeah. So they basically put a stop to all that fun stuff. Um, Which is such a bummer, man. Like yeah, and and basically the only fun thing they did off the bat was the Phineas and Ferb special. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's wild they never did that with Marvel the same way, that they never did official Muppet Marvel toys or anything. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, sidetrack within sidetrack. We've actually been talking a while about general Sesame Street stuff we kind of remember. So I think we can actually split this into another episode for the non-Muppet Sesame Street stuff I yeah, kind of remember. Yeah, yeah. So next time on Things We Kind of Remember, I will talk about non-Muppet segments that I have not revisited but have stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. So until then, this has been At Home with the Dogginses. Um, and to the Sesame Street Corporation, if you would like to hire me, I am willing, I am able, and I am happy to drag my husband to New York if necessary. Honey, if you get a job at Sesame Street, we can move to New York. Yes. Later days, y'all. Later days. Later days.